Hello everyone, I'm Chris and today I have a very special episode for you. Some of you have asked me to share my 3Watch collection and I am here to do just that. So welcome to the studio, Christian. Thanks Chris, great to be here. So why don't we dig straight in and start with your first watch in your collection. All right, so first up is my Grunefeld Principia 1941. So this is my most worn watch, my everyday go-to. I love wearing high horology, but I also love fun watches. And this one with this uh, salmon or orange uh, dial makes it a bit more fun than just a straight up dress piece, but it's still understated enough with the simplicity, no date, just the time that I can wear it every day. I do like to change straps a lot. Currently, it's on a Jean Rousseau rubber strap, very supple, very comfortable to wear, and it's a great color scheme that matches the watch perfectly. I first learned about the Grunefelds when they entered this watch into the GPHG. It was nominated for an award. I didn't quite win it at the time. The Grunefelds did win afterwards. But that's the first I heard of the Grunefeld brothers. And I looked into this watch and instantly I fell in love. I, I knew I had to have it. It was quite the wait to get this watch, but it was definitely worth it. When you look at the movement, it is finished exceptionally. Even though there are other watch movements that are finished to a similar level, the fact that they do it all in steel just adds to the uh, level of execution in my eyes. And why, why steel? Because it's more difficult. When you look closely at the movement, you can see these very unique bridges that form this bell gable shape of a uh, traditional Dutch uh, roof line. Unsurprisingly, since the Grunefels are Dutch, the bridges as well as the rotor have triple finishing. Satinated on the top, brushed raised edges and of course the high polished anglage. They hail from the Renault et Papi stable of watchmakers. They really have learned their craft at the best place. When they were there they specialized in minute repeaters and tourbillons so that tells you about the level of watchmaking. And even though I do appreciate complications as an everyday watch I like a simple watch. Time only or time and date. I wear smaller sizes, not too small because I have a larger wrist, but this one at just under 40 millimeters wears perfectly. When I look at watches, I do consider every detail and case shape and finishing is very important to me as well. The dial not only has this fun color, but also a lovely texture to it. High polished markers and the heat blued hands, it just looks perfect. So after placing the order, I waited two years to get this watch, which is quite a long time, but it's very different from those uh, make-believe wait lists that just tell you that, oh, you might get it or you might not, or you will eventually get it if you spend money. No, they tell you two years and it's two years. And I appreciate that a lot. Not to mention that there are actual watchmakers behind the brand who track their watches, appreciate the collectors who collect them and wear them. You can go on social media, connect with them, see how they were, and that elevates these brands in my eyes to quite a different level. So I'm assuming you didn't start your collecting journey with a Grunefeld. How did you get to this point? No, no, I have to say, when I started, I didn't even know about independence. To be fair, not many existed, I think, pretty much started with Jorn. But when I got into collecting and, and went on forums and, and read articles, no one talked about independence. It was always Omega and, and Rolex, of course. And that, that's where my first foray into watch collecting started. I would say my first significant purchase was a, a moon watch. I knew that the watchmaking aspect, the horology was important to me. And the Moon Watch has such a unique uh, history. It's unparalleled in, in mainstream brands or, or even any, any watch. And also has a um, manual wind chronograph, which is a complicated movement, well finished at the time. It was the 
1863 for me. So that's where I started with my collecting. I did very quickly branch out, but the first brand I learned about that wasn't quite mainstream and, and well-known at the time was Grand Seiko, actually. So um, I acquired a Snowflake. Again, finishing, Dow, and the technology. A lot of people dismiss the uh, spring drive as quartz technology, but, but I don't think that's true. Just because there is a quartz regulator behind the movement, I don't think it qualifies as quartz. It's a very complicated, very unique technology, and I appreciate it a lot. Currently only own one Grand Seiko, which is not the Snowflake anymore, I have to say. Because I did uh, learn that wearing experience was also an important part of, of watch collecting and not just the horology and, and technical aspects of the watches. Uh, we'll always have a Rolex in the collection. But for me, it's very important when I spend this sort of money and we're talking thousands of dollars. So it doesn't matter if it's a Rolex or even a Longines, it's still a substantial amount of money, which is quite unreasonable for something that you don't need and not particularly good at the job either because if you talk about timekeeping there are much better devices out there than a mechanical watch the most important part is how it feels on the wrist how it makes me feel when i put it on i'm only looking at pieces that make me feel special whatever the reason behind that might be so it all started with mainstream brands and as i went deeper down the rabbit hole i discovered independent brands and i just found that they give me so much more for the money than mainstream brands would. I find it today really hard to pick a mainstream watch over an independent one. Oh yeah, the ever famous rabbit hole. So where did it lead you next? Well, uh, as much as I love my Grönefeld, I do want a sports watch in the collection. Something that's swimmable, something that, that can take a bit of a beating, well, not a lot. Uh, I can wear to the beach. I can wear to hiking. When I was looking to add a sports watch to my core collection, there were a few important aspects I considered. First, I wanted something high horology. So not just a plain Rolex or, or Omega. Something that gives me the same feeling as my dress watches, but it's a bit more durable. I also had experience with high horology sports watches before and having a bracelet that's comfortable and adjustable is important to me. And I like that this Chopek Antarctic can be put on a rubber strap or a leather strap very easily. I was eyeing this for a long time before I pulled the trigger and the thing that held me back was actually the dark color. I knew I wanted time only with date but the dark colors they had at the time were already covered in my collection and I couldn't really bring myself to spend this sort of money on something that didn't stand out. And then this Glacier Blue dial was released and I knew immediately that this was the one I was waiting for. So I put in an order, waited for it a little bit as usual, but when I got it I knew that this would be a long-term addition to my collection. And I don't know if it's forever, but I don't see myself parting with it anytime soon. Thanks to the uh, micro rotor movement, it's a very slim profiled watch, but it's still sturdy with a screw down crown and 120 meters water resistance. A lovely stem guilloche from Metalem. When it comes to high horology sports watches, there wasn't really much of a choice for me. A Nautilus or a or a Royal Oak is really out of reach. And the, the uh, ability to change the bracelet for a strap, it really limits the field. Obviously I did consider the overseas, but when I look at this movement, those finger bridges, the open work movement, there's a lot of thought that went into this design. It has a very similar finishing style to the uh, Grönefeld actually. Obviously that's not something you look at all the time, but I do know it's there when I put it on. It's silly when we're talking about horology and finishing and other aspects of the watch and then it comes down to dark color, but that's just the way it is. Yeah, that's fair enough. What would you say you're looking for in a new watch when you're going out to purchase one? 
the most important thing is how it made me feel. But it's not just the object itself. With these two brands, for example, you know who makes them. You know the company, the people behind them. For example, Chapek CEO uh, Xavier is a wonderful person. And every time you see him talk about watches or, or Chapek as a brand, he just radiates enthusiasm. And when you acquire independent watches, that's what it's all about. The enthusiasm. And it's really nice to see someone with the same level of enthusiasm on the other side. Not just someone who wants to take your money and give you an object, but who genuinely shares your enthusiasm for horology, watchmaking, watch collecting. Okay, so looking at your collection here, it's fairly independent focused. Everyone can see that. Does that mean that you're not really into mainstream brands? I do like mainstream watches. So uh, as I said, I started with Omega, Rolex, Grand Seiko, and I still own those brands. I am very picky about the uh, specific pieces that I pick up from those uh, brands. A new bezel color on a uh, GMT doesn't really excite me that much. But uh, there are things that I like from Rolex and there are things that I appreciate from Rolex. I know that they are the biggest brand, they have the best machinery, the best marketing. They have all the resources in the world to put out a very high quality product. But they do make a lot of them and that doesn't make it feel very special. When you go 1.2, 1.3 million watches a year, it's hard to perceive a Rolex as being special or unique. To be fair, that's uh, not a fourth of the watch. It's just a matter of perception. So let's round out this collection with the dress watch. So I am very much a dress watch guy, and that's probably because when it comes to horology, finishing, uh, special movements, they, you usually find them in dress watches. I spent a lot of time looking at dress watches before picking up this one. I considered, obviously, Patek. You can't go past the Calatrava for a dress watch. I did have a Lange before this one, but of course this shows the, uh, the depth of the rabbit hole again I've reached. When I got this Langun Heine, I pretty much got rid of everything else and uh, I knew that this would be my one dress watch that would surpass all others. On the dial side, it's simplicity and elegance incarnate. I wasn't sure about the cathedral hands originally. I was considering something a bit modern looking, but I think that the cathedral hands and the Roman numerals make this watch look very classic. And ultimately a dress watch should be just that simple, time only, classic looking that you can wear with a suit, maybe a tux, <laughs> even though that might be a faux pas, but why the hell not? The only thing where this watch sort of deviates from norm is the case. I opted for a steel case. I know it should be precious metal, but I do like to wear my watches. And I find that with precious metal cases, I tend to be a bit more careful and tend to not wear them so much because I'm worried about dings, not so much scratches. But once you knock it into something, there's a ding on the case. You can't polish it. It will always be there and I'm very particular about the condition of my watches, so I'd rather not have that. The business end, of course, is the movement, and uh, that's what made me go for it. There are high-level finishes in this world when it comes to watch movements, but this is pretty much second to none. I love this uh, architecture of the trigonal bridge that lets you see the gear train, the uh, traditional German-style engraved balance cock, with a little natural diamond on top of the balance wheel. That ratchet wheel and crown wheel solarized and polished to a mirror finish. Of course, you get the uh, anglage on the bridges, hand engraving on the base plate, and this lovely silver brushed finish on top. You look at those gold chatons fixed with blue screws. And when you consider that all these screws are hand cut by a single craftsman, and blued 
polished to a mirror finish and fixed into the bridges without scratching the head. It just shows you the level of dedication that they put into these watches. As far as I know, Langenheine makes 80 to 90 watches a year. So it's a small company in Dresden. Again, it fits very nicely with the theme of special watches. That is certainly an exceptional piece. So was it at all challenging for you to come up with these three today? Well, the only challenge really was to select my dress watch because I do have a very special watch on my wrist, my Lyric Etude number one. Uh, designed and executed by a group of collectors which I was part of and it was a, um, the culmination of a two-year project so because of my involvement with this watch it will always be very special for me one that I will never part with and obviously has the most meaning to me the concept behind this watch was to get a high horology piece by collecting the best suppliers and executing the best watch you can for the money. The heart of the watch is the Agenor AGH 6801 movement. The case is made by Vutilain and Ekatan, a high-end case maker. The dial is actually made by Metalen. After a two-year process, we finally had this watch, an exceptional horology for a fraction of the price that we would have paid to a larger brand. Well, I can certainly see how you would find the Lyrique appealing. I myself like to wear it as a casual or a dress piece on a leather strap, and it is indeed very special. So you started a channel called the Three Watch Collection, and we're here looking at your Three Watch Collection today. Would you be actually happy with just three watches? And be honest. <laughs> Well, no, <laughs> I couldn't really live with three. Uh, it would be too restrictive, but I do like to limit myself to a smaller collection. Currently, my goal is six watches. I do have a few lyrics coming in, but those don't really count towards my six watch collection. So um, I give myself some leeway there. So we're used to seeing the ticking time blonde sitting here where I'm sitting. Where is she today? Ticking time blonde is certainly easier on the eyes than me, or even you, I must say. But she can't always be here. So whenever she's away, the boys come out to play. Well, Chris, it was great to have you here today. It's certainly been an interesting experience for me. And I'm guessing for you too. I hope we satisfied the curiosity of our audience. And guys, if you enjoyed this interview, make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on the next 3Watch collection.